Hey, good morning, friends from Kansas City at Chloe's apartment. I'm happy to be able to bring you this video on Nehemiah chapter 5. Um, we're going to be looking at this incredible chapter that speaks to the issue of social justice and equity, um, where people are provided uh, help in situations where uh, they can't help themselves. And that's what's going on here in Nehemiah 5. Remember, Nehemiah um, has come back from Babylon with the mission of governing the people of Judah and rebuilding the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And so um, he has uh, power and money behind him. Artaxerxes has uh, enabled him to uh, do the best job he can do uh, financially and and by all means that he needs necessary. And so Nehemiah uh, is taken though in this chapter with the condition of uh, the oppressed people of uh, Judah who <laughs> have leveraged themselves to the hilt and to the point that uh, they're selling their children into slavery. And they're not, he, he's making the point that uh, these brothers here now aren't in much better position than than those of us who came from Babylon. Um, we're enslaving our own brothers and sisters. So let's let's just uh, look at some of the key points here in Nehemiah five. Uh, it's a pivotal chapter in the book. Um, it highlights uh, the significant crisis uh, by the people of Jerusalem uh, upon their return from exile in Babylon and. This chapter in particular uh, centers around uh, a pressing issue of economic injustice and oppression. Now, we struggle with some of this, um, both good and bad. In today's culture here in the United States, um, there's a great disparity uh, between uh, the rich and the poor. And what's funny is um, those who uh, have become slightly elevated, uh, it seems to me are understanding the situation better than those who are really empowered with power. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is, is our government leaders are missing it. But yet some of our uh, civic and um, economic leaders have figured this out and are calling attention to it. Now, I'm not saying that we should loan money without interest or or uh, let loans go um, with no repayment. But certainly uh, this was the case in Nehemiah's time. It's what he calls for. The issue of usury and debt uh, are really highlighted. Usury is uh, taxation or interest. And the people are being exploited through exorbitant exorbitant. Um, interest rates and heavy debts and this practice is leading to the loss of their lands and their homes and their children um, they're being uh, put into forced labor the nobles and officials are demanding forced labor for the, from the people because they owe them money and it it only exacerbates the suffering of the people who um, are, are trying to uh, work their way out of oppression. So Nehemiah uh, does an investigation, he does a confrontation, and he asks uh, the nobles and the rulers and the priests to repent. Um, he urges them to cease from their unjust practices, and he emphasizes the needs or, or the needs for compassion and fairness. So let's just look at the chapter together. Um, verse 1, and this is from the ESV. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were many, for there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many. So let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain. Um, because of the famine 
and there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. So they'd like to do something about it, but uh, they don't have any way to help themselves, especially economically. They're truly oppressed. They're uh, not only helpless in their situation, they're being exploited in their situation. So Nehemiah says in verse 6, I was very angry when I heard the outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials, and I said to them, You are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, We, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, The thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations and of our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and a percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. And they said to me, We will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep his promise, so he may be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they promised. I'm just trying to imagine this shaking out of the fold of the garment, but I wonder if it's, um, you know, how when men uh, and women, for that matter, want to be taken notice of or make their point, sometimes men will adjust their tie or clear their throat or it, both sexes will straighten their shirts or whatever uh, to draw attention to what they're about to say. And certainly I think that's what happened when Nehemiah shakes out the fold of his garment. But, you know, the, the Jewish uh, dress and customs uh, were so symbolic and significant that I think this probably had a heightened uh, meaning of a call to attention. So they, the nobles and officials, they make a covenant and they forsake their oppressive ways and they pledge to return the stolen property and treat each other with justice and mercy. And then they make a pledge, a commitment of fairness. Um, the nobles and officials agree to the terms of the covenant, promising to refrain from future exploitation. So it's not only um, not enough to just say you're sorry. People need to know what you're going to do about it or how you're going to make it right. And that's what happens here. Nehemiah confronts the nobles. He admits that he's part of the problem too. And uh, they, they for whatever, are moved. Huh? This is by God, I think. They are moved to, to pledge to do right by their oppressed brothers. So from this um, story, we, we develop some key themes. Um, justice and compassion. Um, Nehemiah's chapter highlights the importance of social justice and compassion. He condemns the exploitation of the vulnerable and calls for a fair and equitable society. I don't know of a good example of this. Um, certainly we think about our history with slavery in our nation, but I I'm thinking it's even uh, farther than that. Let's say we go down to the corner where all the homeless people are living in tent cities and we, we force them to work for us um, just because we can and and then we somehow hold their pay over their head as if they're they owe us this you know uh, it's their their debt to to pay in their way out of the situation they, they can't help themselves they, they need the money and certainly people 
in those situations often don't even know to handle how to handle money but it's just interesting to think that Nehemiah recognizes that he's part of the problem and his leadership is exemplary he uses his authority to address the pressing social issue and protect the rights of the oppressed so he could have been like the governors before him he could have continued to um, exploit the people but he doesn't do that and let's read the rest of the chapter and we'll see an example or we'll see Nehemiah discuss um, what all he did um, to make things right so here's Nehemiah's generosity starting in verse 14 moreover from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. So there's evidently some expense that is provided for by the governor of the land that takes care of what they need as far as uh, providing uh, food for them and their household. But Nehemiah uh, doesn't take advantage of that. As a matter of fact, he doesn't take it at all. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily portion 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Why didn't Nehemiah do like all the others? Because he feared God. He was a God-fearing man. That's why we as Christians, as God-fearing people, as followers of God's Son, Jesus Christ, we are to be different because we are God-fearing. We have a different pecking order than the rest of the world. And at the top of our pecking order is the judge. <laughs> and we understand it. And most people don't. So we have this healthy fear and reverence of God. And we want to do right by God and, and obey Him uh, and be obedient to His ways. Uh, verse 16. I also persevered in the work on this wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all of this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember, for my good, O oh God, all that I have done for this people. <laughs> wow. Can you imagine feeding 150 men every day and then every 10 day uh, providing them with enough wine that we would call it abundance? This is huge expense for Nehemiah. And, you know, yeah, he had the power of Artaxerxes behind him, but yet he could have continued to uh, rake in the 40 shekels of silver a day from the people as the governor's allowance to help pay for all this, but he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He didn't want to oppress the people in any way. He wanted their full cooperation in um, the goal of rebuilding the city walls. And... <laughs> You know, it's interesting, we've talked so much about unity among people and among the church. You know, we need to encourage unity in the church so that we can work together to um, spread the gospel in this world in an effective manner. Because when the church isn't operating uh, on all eight cylinders, and there's a mess in the engine, so to speak, it just doesn't function efficiently. And we need the church to function efficiently. And that call is uh, for unity. That's the only way we can function officially. Um, it's such a good chapter. I know it was short today. But uh, it's just so interesting to think about uh, the Jewish people dealing with social justice issues um, so long ago. And today, uh, as a culture here in the United States that ought to be a fairly mature country by now we're still dealing with social justice issues and uh, I pray that uh, we would be uh, shining lights in our community in fairness and in 
um, justice, mercy, all of those things. And you remember, you know, we don't deserve anything we have through Jesus Christ, yet God has extended grace to us. We need to extend grace to other people as well, even sometimes when they don't have it coming. You know, people don't have to earn everything. Um, sometimes we need to be generous and we need to elevate people just because we love them and because we can. Not, not because that we're in it for any sort of, oh, look at me, look at me, but because we love people and we want to be like Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I'm grateful this morning for this opportunity to share Nehemiah chapter 5 with the folks back home. And I just pray a blessing, Father, on them today and all of those that are dealing with illnesses and disease and sickness. I just pray your healing hand upon them. And there are several right within our congregation, Father, that are suffering with serious conditions. And I just pray, Father, that you would comfort them, give them strength to go through whatever treatment is ahead of them or whatever they're already starting, uh, strengthen their families. Uh, Father, we just pray for, for peace uh, during the times of the storm. It seems like uh, if we're not in the storm, there's one coming. So just help us to endure, to persevere, to continue to focus upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Have a great Sunday, my friends. Miss you. See you next week.